Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are doing a brand new series for our IEB students, and I'm going to be tackling all of your past paper exam questions because they are quite different from CAPS exam questions. They are often more challenging, um, and they require a lot more application knowledge than a standard CAPS. And so you're going to see a lot more of these videos as we go along throughout the year. I'm going to be making a lot more IEB content for you guys. So make sure that you have your notifications turned on because I post new content every Tuesday and Thursday. And if you are in grade 12 and you are doing IEB, don't forget to go check out my study guide, the cheat sheet. The cheat sheet is applicable to both IEB and CAPS documents. And so you will definitely find it very useful as you try and condense and simplify the content because that's the beauty of the cheat sheet. It makes studying so easy. It feels like you're cheating. Now, this particular question that I chose is a challenging question. I have ranked it as a hard question. Um, later on in the series, I'm going to do some advanced questions. And this particular question is broken into two. It requires two different skills, but I'm going to walk you through it right now. And if you'd like to pause the video, do so now, attempt the question, and then I'm going to walk you through how to answer this question for full marks and then include the memo at the end of the video. So diving straight into our question, it says the images below show a diagram of Drosophila or a fruit fly and the chromosomes of a male and a female fruit fly. So let's just quickly unpack what we're looking at here. This is a Drosophila or a fruit fly. Literally, if, if we've learned anything about genetics, you maybe already know that they are really important in the study in the field of genetics because they're really simple. And as you can see, they have very few chromosomes. Now, these um, two collections, let's call them karyotypes, if that's what you are comfortable with. Um, it's really important to understand what you're looking at here. And if you look too quickly, you're going to make a very common mistake. The first thing I want you to notice before we answer any questions is they have told you that this is a female and these are the sex chromosomes and this is a male and likewise over here and you'll automatically notice that they have the exact same sex chromosomes as humans. So it's important to note that but I want you to also know something else. Don't always assume that the sex chromosomes will be the same in any other animal as they are in humans. That's not always the case. The next thing that I don't want you to overlook is when you study this picture, I want you to know that those are individual chromosomes. So if I were to like highlight one, that is one chromosome. Yes, they're very close to their homologous partner, which is right next door to it. And so if I highlight another pair down here in a different color, it's important that you are comfortable enough and confident enough to know that those those are individual chromosomes and not replicated or duplicated because remember they would have the appearance where you would have a centromere in the center so they'd be joined together or alternatively you might even notice that they kind of have this hairpin shape to them which I'm just going to sketch here on the side you'll notice they have like a, a dent in the center that's another way that they are drawn and if they were replicated then they would meet in the middle and it kind of would make this X shape so the last thing then is to count how many you actually have. And so if we count, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven and eight are tiny in the middle there. And so let's just write that down and note it for later and let's get into the questions. So question one says, from the information provided, state the diploid number of chromosomes found in a somatic fruit fly. Well, we've already calculated and counted that and that is going to be eight. Now, how did I know that? I simply counted it from the karyotype provided. And also remember, diploid means we haven't gone through any meiosis. Now, let's get into the next question. Number two, how is sex determination in fruit flies similar to that in humans? And literally, it's only one mark. And so all we're going to mention for this one is the fact that females are XX just like they are in humans and males are XY just like they are in human males. So that's all you actually need to say. For number three, it says draw one gamete to show the correct number and shape 
of the chromosomes that could be produced as a result of meiosis in the female fruit fly. Refer to the diagram above you to assist, or above to assist you. Now, this is really important. Number one, you must, must draw only the female. Now, looking at the differences between the male and female, I want you to look very, very carefully. If by accident you draw the wrong um, grouping or you draw the male, you'll notice the male's Y chromosome is bent inwards like that. And so you really got to be very careful now when you draw your diagrams. So it says one gamete. So when we are drawing one gamete, what we need is as standard, we need a line diagram. And of course, we always need to provide a heading. And so your heading needs to be along the lines of diagram showing the chromosome number in a female fruit fly gamete. That's what we're going to put there as our heading, right? We always put a heading. Now, what is it going to look like on the inside? Well, remember, we started off with eight chromosomes. If we've gone through meiosis and we've made a gamete, we're only going to have four. So now it's really important to pay attention as to which ones you are going to put inside of this diagram and make sure, most importantly, because this is how you lose marks in IEB, you must have an attention to detail. You must notice, if I bring your attention back up to the karyotype of the female, that the shape of these chromosomes must be mimicked or copied into your diagram. That means, for example, if we are going to, and I'm going to just quickly remove all of the coloring off here so you can see what I'm doing, you need to make sure that when you draw this particular chromosome, it's straight. So you need to make sure you've got one straight chromosome. Now going into our next set of chromosomes, we're going to go to the next pair and we're going to select just one. We're going to draw that one. And again, we want to pay close attention to its shape, but also its size because it's important to know that when we mark at the end of the year, detail is important. And so if there's shading or if there is a size difference, it's important to include it. Then we're going to select one of these teeny tiny little ones. And remember, you want to keep the size correct. So let's put a little one in there. And then last but not least, we want to select just one of the partners on the other side. And we're also going to make that lean inwards as well. So now we know there is a difference. Now we know that there is the correct chromosome number. We've done our drawing rules. It doesn't ask you to label anything, as you may notice here. So if you have given the correct number, you have given the correct sizes and shapes, you've got your heading, you're going to get five out of five. Now let's move on to the more challenging application question when it comes to a genetic cross. Now, this particular question says, in fruit flies, the eye color gene is sex linked. The moment you hear that, you must go, okay, I'm going to work with X's and Y's. Red eye color is the dominant color then to white. So this is also really important. We'll come back to that soon. It says use a genetic cross or Punnett square to show the cross between a white female and a red-eyed male. Express the probability of the expected phenotypes of the offspring as a ratio. And that's also really important because they're telling you what they want at the very end. Do they want a ratio, a fact? A, a fraction or do they want a percentage? Last important piece of information is they have now told you what our key is and it's telling you it's also carried on the X chromosome. So now let's be very careful before we begin anything. Let's write out before we start what the male and the female is. So the female is white-eyed, right? So that means she's got two X chromosomes and because she is white-eyed and white is a recessive trait, she's going to have to carry two small R's on each of her X's. Then for our male, he is XY and he is red-eyed, which means that he carries only one and he only has one um, X, so he can only carry one eye color gene and that is for red. Now what we need to do is take those um, genotypes and we're going to put them into a genetic cross. 
Now, different schools teach different things, but I firmly believe that there is the best way, is my way, to lay out a Punnett square and a genetic cross so you get full marks. And this is how we're going to do it. So step one, in the margin, we're always going to put P1, and we are going to put our white-eyed female multiplied by our red-eyed male, and it's really important to put male and female because it's a sex cross, and we're going to put in their genotypes. Oh, that must be a capital R, and our Y, okay? Then we are going to write our meiosis, and we're going to put our in the side piece over here. We're going to put gametes, and now what we're going to do is I always tell my students to put their gametes inside circles. It just prevents you from making the mistake of writing them too close together and then the marker thinks that they are not gametes. They're still like solid pairs. We're going to write the word fertilization. And then in the margin over here, we're going to put F1 for filial or offspring. We're going to do our little Punnett square over here now. We're going to put in our individual alleles and now we're going to do our cross. Now a lot of people ask me very often, or students will say, ma'am, which letter goes first and where? Well, generally you are going to write the dominant allele first, as you've noticed here every time I wrote the dominant allele first. And if you are doing a cross where there are two dominant alleles, like if you were doing codominance, then you pick the allele that is first alphabetically to come first. But it's not a train smash if you swap them around. This is a small r, y, and this is a small r, y. So let's get back to our question so that I can fully express this. It says, express the probability of the expected phenotypes of the offspring as a ratio. Lovely. So let's make sure that we are doing that for the phenotypes because that's what they want me to focus on. So let's group all the same phenotypes together. So we've got two males here that are white-eyed. Okay, so we're going to have two white male. Then above that, we've got a big letter and a small letter, which means these two females have red eyes. So that means I've got two red female, which remember, they want this in a ratio, is a 2 is to 2 ratio, or if we simplify it, is a 1 is to 1 ratio. Now, here is the memo for your reference. I have found it very challenging to use IEB memos, the ones that I give you on the internet, because um, they don't put the tick marks in anywhere. There is one over here, you'll notice, but otherwise you, you can't actually see where marks are allocated. And so I understand that for a lot of IEB matriculants, you want to see where the marks are allocated. And so you've really got to cover all your bases and just make sure that you are giving everything that is necessary in the memo. And remember, ask yourself, can I be more specific? If the answer is yes, then be more specific. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed because I'll see you all again soon. Bye.